Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring The Personal Consequences of Going Into Space Wonderlust by Alan E. Nurse And Miles to Go Before I Sleep by William F. Nolan Floor of Heaven by T. D. Ham The Altar at Midnight by C. M. Cornbluth Star Mother by Robert F. Young Wonderlust by Alan E. Nurse Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, October 1952. Narrated by Tom Trisser. Somehow George Barlow had sensed that something was wrong the moment his son drove into the barnyard that evening. He had been waiting impatiently for Tad's return all afternoon. The men needed those tractor bolts before they could do the mowing. But George had felt the uneasiness, quite suddenly, deep in his chest, when he heard the boy's three-wheeler chugging up the rutted country road from town. He sat quietly, waiting, stroking old Snuffy behind the ears. He heard the little motor-car pop into silence as Tad drove it into the garage. Then there was a long silence. George waited several minutes before running a hand through his tawny hair. "'What's that boy doing out there anyway?' he growled. Florence Barlow glanced up through the kitchen window. "'He's gone up on the ridge,' she said. "'He's just standing up there, looking down the valley.' She turned back to the stove, pushing back an unruly wisp of greying hair. George sat back in his chair, puffing his pipe, the uneasiness growing. Tad was usually back from town hours earlier. The oats had to be cut this week. The shipment of Venusian taro was due from the next rocket, and they had to have a field free for it. But still, he knew it was more than the tractor bolts that bothered him. Then suddenly the door burst open and Tad was there, filling the room with his broad shoulders, whistling tunelessly to himself. A cool east breeze followed him in the door, and with it an aura of excitement. Tad's sun-baked hair was wild from the ride through the wind, his sharp eyes sparkling. Dad, the rocket landed this afternoon, out at Dillon's landing. It's three weeks early this time. A chill swept up George's spine, tingling his scalp. Then we should get the taro in a couple of days he said smoothly. We should. Tad's eyes were bright as he patted the dog's head. His whole body seemed alive with excitement. I walked up on the ridge to get a look at it, Dad. It's a beauty, tall and slim. You should see it down there. It catches the sunset like you never saw before. He was still talking as he walked out to the kitchen, stooping to kiss his mother on the forehead. You ought to go up and take a look at it, Mum, before the sun's gone. "'I've got plenty to do without going to gawk at a rocket ship,' his mother's voice was sharp. "'You have, too, for that matter. Did you get the tractor bolts for your father?' The boy frowned suddenly and snapped his fingers. "'Plum forgot them. The ship was landing just as I got into town, so I went over to watch it.' He took his place opposite his father at the table, his face brightening again. He didn't see the cloud on his father's face. "'And they let us go inside it to look around, Dad. "'I never saw anything like it. "'You wouldn't believe that they could get such a ship off the ground. "'Why, even I can remember when it was all they could do "'to blast off with a little ten-man ship. "'And now, why, this one is like a yacht. "'It's the Star King, the newest one in Dylan's fleet.' "'George Barlow scowled, "'the tightness in the pit of his stomach "'suddenly making his food tasteless. "'That's lovely,' he said sourly. They can build them a mile long, for all I care. They still aren't fit for rats. At least here you can wash your face if you want to. 
He turned back to his plate, hoping the discussion was over. Hoping. But this one had complete showers, soft bunks, everything. Hydroponic tanks that make the experimental station look like pikers. It, said George. Tad lapsed into silence, the hearty silence of a hungry nineteen-year-old before a full dinner plate. His father took another mouthful and put down his fork, his appetite gone. He could feel the tension growing, the tightness of his breathing. He sensed his wife's apprehension as she too slowed and stopped eating, as if she, too, were waiting. "'Saw Len Cooper when he came off the ship, too, Dad. Do you remember Len? This was his first cruise.' Tad's eyes sparkled. He says there's nothing like it, that rocket life. They stopped on Venus, you know, and then did a reconnaissance in toward the Mercury orbit before they came back, almost five years away from Earth. They got a stack of reports as big as an almanac for printing, and Len, you know how scrawny he was, he's put on muscle now, looks great. Tad put down his fork, a subtle change in his voice, his hands trembling. We had a long talk, Dad. Len says... "'Len Cooper's a fool!' George Barlow's voice snapped irritably. "'He hasn't got all his marbles. A kid like that, all the potential in the world, brains, opportunity, and what does it do with it? Shoots it into rockets. First cruise, huh? It isn't his last by a long shot. Those rocket boys aren't stupid. They know it takes a good cruise to teach a youngster his way around out there. He can't begin to work for his wages until the second cruise or the third, and then it's too late to come back.' Tad fiddled with his fork, his eyes down. The room was silent. Even Florence sat tense, startled by the outburst. George sat glumly. That was stupid, he thought, inexcusably stupid. You'll have to face it some day, you know that. Now? Maybe. Oh, Lord, not now. Maybe tomorrow. But what could you say? What if it is now? His hand trembled as he fumbled awkwardly for his pipe. Where were the words, the phrases, the arguments, so long rehearsed, so sensible, so fatherly? Dad! His fingers were like ice on the pipe bowl. Not tomorrow, then. Now. Dad! Yes, Dad. The boy looked straight at his father, his voice very low. I'm going, Dad, he said. I'm going with it. The chill widened in George Barlow's stomach, spreading into his legs and chest. He heard his wife's startled gasp, and the chill deepened. He searched for words, and no words came. How long now had he prepared, rehearsed, and now nothing? He just sat there in the dead still room. Well, I never heard anything more ridiculous in all my life. Florence burst out finally. You're crazy, Tad. Plum crazy. Do you mean to sit there and say that you're going to give up college, throw away this farm? She set the cream pitcher down with a thump. It's out of the question. You just can't mean it. Tad wriggled uneasily. I do mean it, Mum. The Star King is signing up crew tomorrow. They have places for four novices this time. They'll take me. I know they will. I, I asked this afternoon. I want to go. George Barlow gripped the edge of the table, fighting for control. "'Don't be silly, boy,' he said finally, his voice tight. "'You're no rocket man. You don't know what you're saying.' His hands trembled. "'Space is no place for a fellow like you. You belong here, studying, working, not hopping around space like a common tramp.' He tamped tobacco into his pipe bowl with an air of finality. Every boy nowadays thinks about going to space, I know. The fleets are growing larger, taking more and more boys. But the smart ones stay home. Tad's voice was low and quiet, more deadly firm than George had ever heard it. You don't understand, Dad. I know you don't like it. I know you think it's foolish not to finish college. You hate to see me leave home, but you don't understand. He looked up his boyish face pale on a deep summer tan. I can't explain it, Dad. Ever since I was little, since I saw my first rocket shooting up into the sky toward the stars, I knew I had to go, too, sometime. He shook his head helplessly. It's what I wanted all my life, Dad. I've got to go. But 
the farm, son? Florence was almost in tears. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Your family's been here for a hundred years, Tad. It's yours as soon as you're ready to farm it. Don't you care about it after all these years? You know I care, Mum. The boy avoided her tearful eyes, ran a hand through his hair. You know I like the place, and I feel awful running out after all the work you and Dad and the men have put in, building it up. But I couldn't make a go of it. I don't want to be earthbound, tied down to a piece of land all my life. His mother's face was suddenly very, very tired. Oh, you fool, she said, her voice bitter. You don't know how you'll long for green grass again. Her face fled red in anger. You've barely started to shave, and you want to go to space. Well, it's nonsense. You can't go. It's final. Tell him, George. Tell him why he can't go. Tell him why. Florence. She stopped short, eyes wide. George, I'm sorry. His voice was sharp, urgent. I think maybe Tad and I ought to talk this out. Ourselves. I'm sorry, George. Florence Barlow rose silently. She began clearing the table, her eyes brimming. Tad's face was troubled. I wish you wouldn't make a fuss, Dad. I suppose it's a surprise to you both. George smiled sourly. Hardly. We've been around a while, Tad. We saw Len Cooper go, and a half dozen like him. We knew you'd get the bug sooner or later, but you've got to understand why we can't allow it. The room was silent, except for the faint rustling of the breeze through the curtains. You don't know what you're walking into, Tad. None of you boys really know. You only see one side of the picture, the excitement and adventure. I know it's a thrilling picture, but the thrill wears off. And then you have the long, dull days of waiting, sitting, always waiting, with nothing to see but the bulkhead and a dozen men cramped into impossible tight quarters without any room to move around. You don't know how you'd get to hate those men, how you wish you could be alone for just a little while, how you'd long for privacy, and you don't realise the danger, not the exciting, bravado kind of danger that you read about, but the live, horrible danger of depending for your life on a little sliver of metal. So many things can go wrong, and any one of them means you're through. Not a brave death, son, nor a heroic death, just a very lonely death, where you freeze and starve and feel the life choke out of you. There are so many ways to die in space, such horrible ways, so easily. And there isn't any reward worth the risk. It's all risk, and you have nothing for it. A few days of glory when you're back home, and then you're off again. Once you go, you're gone. You'll never come back. Only the lucky ones come back. You'll be in space till it kills you. But the colonies, Dad. Mars Mountain. Players Folly. Ironstone. They're all going concerns. They need men. Lots of men. With ideas. Men who aren't afraid of work. The colonies! George Barlow's voice rose angrily, his control wearying thin. Why the colonies? What glory can you see in working a lifetime to squeeze a living out of Mars rock, scraping and fighting, squeezing every last drop of water, every possible inch of topsoil to dig up enough to keep barely alive, and then dying thirty years before your time? What can you see in that? Or Venus, where you sweat and waste away until the fungus gets into your lungs and blood and you finally just go to sleep forever? You're crazy, Tad. You can't do it. Tad shuffled his feet, his eyes downcast. I knew you wouldn't understand. I can't explain it, Dad. I don't know the words, but I've got to go, even if you don't. George's face flushed in exasperation. Now look, just listen a minute. I understand perfectly. I just... You don't understand! The boy's eyes blazed in sudden anger. His voice was bitter. How could you understand? You've been nothing but a slogging dirt farmer all your life. How could you understand why I'd want to go to the stars? What do you know about Mars or Venus? You've never been there! 
George Barlow sat stiff, as though he had been struck. The room was tense, and he heard the boy breathing across the room. Then you give me no choice, he said finally, his voice suddenly tired and barely audible. I am your father. I forbid you to go. There was a long, silent moment. Then, I am sorry, Dad. I am going anyway. George Barlow lay in bed, breathing quietly. The room was close, the air stuffy and humid. He heard his wife's steady breathing, peaceful now, after sobbing herself to sleep. And somehow, deep within him, he seemed to hear the steady pom-pom-pom of spaceship engines, deep, throaty, thrilling, throbbing, vibrating, calling. He rose quietly and walked to the window. He heard Snuffy stir herself, heard her claws scrabbling on the bare farmhouse floor, and felt her warm muzzle firm and comforting in his hand. Then he heard nothing but the buzzing of cicadas, the quiet night sounds of the farm, smelled the cool, hearty odour of hay and clover, heard the occasional uneasy stomping of cattle in the barn, and still, deep in his mind, he heard older sounds, more familiar sounds, sounds tinged with fear, horror, hate, desperation. He shook his head, trying to forget, but there was excitement there too, that intangible, overpowering thrill of the wanderlust. Memories flooded back into his mind, memories he had thought long ago blotted out and forgotten. The rich thrill of excitement as the last seconds crowded in close, with a strap cutting a deep welt across his chest, the muffled roar, the powerful sledgehammer blow, driving his stomach and legs down like lead, then easing, easing gently into no pressure, then less than no pressure. The exhilarating, wonder-filled vision of the earth rushing away, dwindling into a mottled patchwork, still dwindling. Oh, he understood all right. He knew what tugged at its son's heels. He knew the consuming thrill, the insatiable hunger to reach higher and higher, to seek out unknown places. He knew the wonder of stepping on another land, an alien land, the thrill of watching two moons creep softly over a reddish horizon. He knew the deep, rich thrill of pushing the frontier outward until the sun winked coldly like another star. Memories flooded his mind, and he remembered too well the insistent tug of the wanderlust at his heels, the call of the open road, the call of space and he knew that, try as he would, no earth-bound answer would ever dry it away. Yes, he understood, but deep in his heart he felt the coldness, the pain and agony, the sense of bitter loss. He was one of the lucky. He had come back. Tad would never come back. The odds were too great. There were too few of the lucky and it was better not to be one of the lucky, better to die out there, forgotten, unmourned. Maybe who should have told the boy while he was young, tried to teach him, to make him understand. Perhaps he'd been wrong to conceal it all these years, to lie to Tad, to make Florence conceal too. Perhaps Tad should have been told, but even knowing that some day the wanderlust would come, he knew he couldn't have told him. Better to conceal, to wait for the contempt, wait to hear the words, short, bitter words. How could you ever understand? You've never been there. George felt the perspiration trickle down his neck. How could he explain the things he hardly dared think about himself? The fear, the bitterness, the horror. Tad would be sleeping now, peacefully, in his room his bag half-packed on the dresser, dreaming dreams of wonder in his sleep, and never dreaming for an instant of the terror, the pain, never knowing how hard a taskmaster the wanderlust could be, what terrible fees it could exact. He knew he couldn't fight it. 
He had known since Tad was born that it would be useless, for the young saw only what they wanted to see. And suddenly George was fumbling in his dresser drawer, frantically searching for the small oblong box, rushing before he changed his mind. His hands closed on the small container and its contents were cold between his fingers. And then he was in Tad's room, quietly, seeking the bag, half-packed, a few meagre clothes, a few meagre memories to go away with a hopeful heart. He fumbled in the bag, and suddenly the memories closed in on George Barlow, and he was living again the horrible moments, the rumbling, jolting thunder in the bowels of the ship, the frantic scrambling down the dark passageways, the men, fear-crazed and tumbling over each other in free fall, the gleaming white-hot of the atomic fires gone wild, the screams of agony, the crashing, fiery groping through oven-like chambers, the twisting, wrenching of controls, fighting to stay alive, fighting in blazing agony, fire burning to the bottom of his soul. The little metal disc slipped into the boy's bag, down between a pair of pants and a book, a thin metal disc of pure gold, a simple symbol, with simple words, to George L. Barlow, for heroism in space. He dropped the disc into the boy's bag and stumbled back to his room. He sat in the silence, stroking old Snuffy's soft muzzle, sat in darkness, eternal since that hour of terror, as tears streamed down scarred cheeks from his sightless eyes. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. And Miles to Go Before I Sleep By William F. Nolan Originally published in Infinity, August 1958 Narrated by Tom Trissel Alone within the humming ship, deep in its honeycombed metal chambers, Murdoch waited for death. While the rocket moved inexorably toward Earth, an immense silver needle threading the dark fabric of space, he waited calmly through the final hours, knowing that the verdict was absolute, that hope no longer existed. Electronically self-sufficient, the ship was doing its job perfectly, the job it had been built to do. After twenty years in space, the ship was taking Robert Murdoch home. Home. Earth. Thayerville, a small town in Kansas. Clean air, a shaded street, and a white two-story house at the end of the block. Home, after two decades among the stars. Sitting quietly before the round port, seeing and not seeing the endless darkness surrounding him, Murdoch was remembering. He remembered the worried face of his mother, her whispered prayers for his safety as he mounted the rocket ramp those twenty years ago. He could still feel the final crushing handshake of his father, moments before the outer airlock slid closed. His mother had been fifty-five then, his father sixty-three. It was almost impossible to believe that they were now old and white-haired. And what of himself? He was now forty-one, and space had weathered him as the plains of Kansas had weathered his father. He too had laboured as his father had laboured, but on strange, alien worlds, under suns far hotter than Sol. Murdoch's face was square and hard-featured, his eyes dark and deep under thrusting ledges of bone. He had changed as they had changed. He was a stranger going home to strangers. Carefully, 
Murdoch unfolded his mother's last letter, written in her flowery, archaic hand, and received just before Earth take-off. "'Dearest Bob, oh, we are so excited! Your father and I listened to your voice on the tape over and over, telling us that you are coming home to us at last. We are both so eager to see you, son. As you know, we have not been too well of late.' Your father's heart does not allow him out much any more, and I have had a few fainting spells over the past month. But Dr. Thom said that we are all right, and you are not to worry. Just hurry home to us, Bob. We both pray God you will come back safely. All our love, Mother. Robert Murdoch put the letter aside and clenched his fists. Only brief hours remained to him, and the small Kansas town of Thayerville was an impossible distance across space. He knew he would never reach it alive. The lines of an ancient poem by Robert Frost whispered through his mind, But I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep. He had promised his parents that he would come home, and he meant to keep that promise. The doctors had shown him that it was impossible. They had charted his death. They had told him when his heart would stop beating, when his breathing would cease. Death, for Robert Murdoch, was a certainty. His alien disease was incurable. But they had listened to his plan. They had listened and agreed. Now, with less than half hour of life remaining, Murdoch was walking down one of the ship's long corridors, his boot heels ringing on the narrow metal walkway. He was ready, at last, to keep his promise. Murdoch paused before a wall storage locker, twisted a small dial. A door slid smoothly back. He looked up at the tall man standing motionless in the darkness. Reaching forward, Murdoch made a quick adjustment. The tall man stepped down into the corridor, and the light flashed in his deep-set eyes, almost hidden behind thrusting ledges of bone. The man's face was hard and square-featured. "'My name is Robert Murdoch,' said the tall figure in the neat patrol uniform. "'I am forty-one years of age, a rocket pilot going home to Earth.' He paused and I am sound of mind and body. Murdoch nodded slowly. Indeed you are, he said. How much longer do you have, sir? Another ten minutes? Perhaps a few seconds beyond that? replied Murdoch. I... I'm sorry, said the tall figure. Murdoch smiled. He knew that a machine, however perfect, could not experience the emotion of sorrow, but it eased him to hear the words. You will be fine, he thought. You will serve well in my place, and my parents will never suspect that their son has not come home to them. It must all be perfect, said Murdoch. Of course, said the machine. When the month I am to spend with them is over, they'll see me board a rocket for space and they'll understand that I cannot return to them for another twenty years. They will accept the fact that a spaceman must return to the stars, that he cannot leave the service before he is sixty. Let me assure you, sir, it will all go well. Yes, Murdoch told himself, it will go well. Every detail has been considered. My voice is his voice. My habits his own. The tapes I have pre-recorded will continue to reach them at specified intervals until their death. They will never know I'm gone. "'Are you ready now, sir?' the tall figure asked gently. Murdoch drew in his breath. "'Yes,' he said. "'I'm ready now.' And they began to walk down the long corridor. Murdoch remembered how proud his parents had been when he was finally accepted for space training, the only boy in Thayerville to be chosen. But then it was only right that he should have been the one, 
The other boys, those who failed, had not lived the dream as he had lived it. From the moment he had watched the first moon rocket land, he had known, beyond any possible doubt, that he would become a rocket man. He had stood there, in that cold December of 1980, a boy of twelve, watching the great rocket fire down from space, watching it thaw and blacken the frozen earth. He had known that he would one day follow it back to the stars, to vast and alien horizons, to worlds past imagining. He remembered his last night on earth twenty long years ago, when he had felt the pressing immensity of the vast and terrible universe surrounding him as he lay in his bed. He remembered the sleepless hours before dawn, when he could feel the tension building within the single room within himself lying there in the heated stillness of the small white house. He remembered the rain, near morning, drumming the roof, and the thunder roaring powerfully across the Kansas sky. And then, somehow, the thunder's roar blended into the deep atomic roar of a rocket, carrying him away from earth, away to the burning stars, away, away. The tall figure in the neat patrol uniform closed the outer airlock and watched the body drift into blackness. The ship and the android were one, two complex and perfect machines doing their job. For Robert Murdoch, the journey was over. The long miles had come to an end. Now he would sleep forever in space. When the rocket landed, the crowds were there, waving and shouting out Murdoch's name as he appeared on the silver ramp. He smiled and raised his hand in salute, standing there tall in the sun, his splendid dress uniform reflecting the light in a thousand glittering patterns. At the far end of the ramp, two figures waited. An old man, bowed and trembling over a cane, and a seamed and wrinkled woman, her hair blowing white, her eyes shining. When the tall spaceman reached them, they embraced him feverishly, clinging tight to his arms. Their son had returned. Robert Murdoch had come home from space. Well, said a man at the fringe of the crowd, there they go. His companion sighed and shook his head. I still don't think it's right somehow. It just doesn't seem right to me. It's what they wanted, isn't it? asked the other. It's what they wrote in the wills. They vowed their son would never come home to death. In another month he'll be gone anyway, back for another twenty years. Why ruin it all for him? The man paused, shading his eyes against the sun. And they are perfect, aren't they? He'll never know. I suppose you're right, nodded the second man. He'll never know. And he watched the old man and the old woman and the tall son until they were out of sight. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. Floor of Heaven by T. D. Ham Originally published in Amazing Stories, January 1961 Narrated by Tom Trisser The three crew members of the Ad Astra looked at one another, grinning weakly in the whispering silence after the motors had kicked off. This was the culminating point of a half-century of preparation Behind them was the satellite launching station. Ahead of them, a faint red dot, was Mars. Brian, nominal head of the expedition, touched the shutter studs that opened their windows on the universe. They stood silently, the three of them, Brian and Huges, looking back at the majesty of the retreating Earth, 
Williams, rigid with ecstasy at the forward port. The stars were his passion and his joy. Women filled a momentary need. Men he accepted or rejected as they could help him to achieve his goal. Now, as astrogator of the Ad Astra, he had fulfilled his dream. And now before him, Canopus, Rigel, Cassiopeia, and Aldebaran lay jewel-like on the dark velvet of space. How stars had absorbed the thoughts of mankind since the beginning, he thought happily. And what dreams had the ancient Chaldeans known as they mapped the roots of the galleons of space? And the poets? See how the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patterns of bright gold, he quoted softly. My, that's pretty, Brian said solemnly behind him. Who said that? Williams did, returned Huge's equally deadpan. Williams flushed under their good-natured grins. Shakespeare said it, you uneducated yokels, he said loftily. How come you aren't cheating each other at gin rummy yet? Last I heard, one of you owed the other a million dollars. It was only six hundred thousand, Hughes grinned, and I'm about to take him double or nothing. The weeks passed slowly. Barely audible, the computers ticked, keeping the ship on course. Brian and Hughes wrangled amiably over their interminable card games, throwing an occasional joking aside to Williams watching the stars, absorbed as a miser fingering his jewels. Mars, from a minute speck, grew to a planet lying bloody in the cold rays of the distant sun. Strapped down in obedience to the computer-given signal, the ship reversed, fired its rockets, and touched down on her supporting pillars of flame and became only a shining needle dwarfed in the immensity of the pinkish-red desert. They looked at each other doubtfully, conscious of anticlimax. This was little different from the far reaches of the Gobi Plateau where they had trained for weary, boring months. Brian and Hughes drew the lots as the two to don their heated protective suits and explore within cautious distance of the ship. Williams, restless and bored, watched their horseplay resentfully. Even the tenuous atmosphere of the dead world dimmed the splendour of the heavens. Why didn't they hurry and get it over with? He shivered a little, watching Brian and Hughes trudging clumsily in the sand, throwing out a comment occasionally for the benefit of the tape recorder in the cabin. This is different from the deserts back home, Hughes said. Back there you get the feeling they're just waiting for somebody to move in, but here... It's more like a haunted house, Brian finished for him. Williams, adjusting his headphones, was conscious of a deepening of his faint uneasiness. Why didn't they hurry up and get back? All they really had to do was build a cairn and plant the Federation flag. They had found a few rocks, and Brian was stooping to bury the prepared canister with the data of the flight. Williams watching incredulously as Brian and Hughes reeled and staggered, was dimly conscious of a sudden faint tremor along the ship. There was an abrupt metallic shrieking in his headset, a background of thundering, grinding bedlam, and over it Brian's voice frantic. Cave in! Lift ship! Lift ship! It had been the one constant in the shifting nebulous mass of theory drilled into them. They were valuable. The ship was irreplaceable. With the last unbelieving look of horror at the gigantic crack widening under the very feet of his companions, William threw himself into the control seat and threw the lever over to take-off position. The rockets fired, and the ship rose majestically, the thousand-foot fiery splendour of a trail blotting out the space-suited figures toppling into the thundering chasm. Hours later, Williams pulled himself up, looking around dazedly. The motors had shut off, and the great ship was coasting noiselessly along the return track. Only the computers ticked steadily, and the air valves made a muted shushing in the silence. 
Funny he hadn't noticed the silence on the way out. Sometimes he had even been irritated with the noise Brian and Hughes had made with their eternal wrangling over their cards. Automatically, he pushed the forward viewing plate button, feeling the familiar sense of timeless peace as he looked out on the eternal suns. Mechanically, he ate and slept in the days that followed, dimly aware of a giggling, wild-eyed stranger in some remote corner of his mind, waiting to overtake him if he showed awareness of his presence. He pushed away, too, the thought of Brian and Hughes, forgetting in the sameness of his days that he had ever been anything but alone. At first he had cried a little in his lonesomeness, but as the weeks went on, he remembered only that once there had been others who had deserted him. He nodded familiarly to the stars, smiling a little. There was only himself and them shining steadfastly above him. They would never change, never desert him. Time went by unnoticed. The green dot of earth became a glowing green and blue orb circled by a tiny white dot. The computer changed its rhythm. Above the control board, the strap-in warning flashed unseen as the rockets fired swinging the ship into the turnover, ready for orbit with a satellite ferry station. Williams, gazing with dreamy pleasure at the jewelled curtain above him, was hurled against the port by the sudden surge of acceleration. The ship heeled over, twisted, then turned. Williams hung head down, screaming as the black curtain tore, the stars falling dizzily away, below him. A year later, the psychiatrists, quite pleased with themselves, found him ready for duty again. Not in space, of course, but the hero of the first Mars expedition was always sure of a job with space authority. Now he could even look up at the stars at night without screaming with vertigo. Tonight, walking confidently along the country road, fragrant and dotted with shining pools after the recent rain, he looked up, thinking nostalgically, the patterns of bright gold. A coldness about his feet halted him. He looked down, and once again the black curtain tore before his eyes, once more there were there the cold, unfriendly stars swinging in the empty void below him. Falling downward past the whirling suns, he screamed, hardly aware of the choking wetness in his lungs. About him the inch-deep shining pool rippled for a moment and was still, reflecting once more the floor of heaven. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Altar at Midnight by C. M. Kornbluth Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, November 1952 Narrated by Tom Trussel Doing something for humanity may be fine for humanity, but rough on the individual. He had quite a rum blossom on him for a kid, I thought at first, but when he moved closer to the light by the cash register to ask the bartender for a match or something, I saw it wasn't that. Not just the nose, broken veins on his cheeks too, and the funny eyes. He must have seen me look because he slid back away from the light. The bartender shook my bottle of ale in front of me like a Swiss bell ringer, so it foamed inside the green glass. "'You ready for another, sir?' he asked. I shook my head. Down the bar he tried it on the kid. He was drinking scotch and water or something like that, and found out he could push him around. He sold him three scotch and waters in ten minutes. When he tried for number four, the kid had his courage up and said, "'I'll tell you when I'm ready for another, Jack.' but there wasn't any trouble. It was almost nine, and the place began to fill up. The manager, a real hood type, stationed himself by the door to screen out the high school kids and give the big hello to conventioneers. 
The girls came hurrying in too, with their little make-up cases and their fancy hair piled up, and their frozen faces with the perfect mouths drawn on them. One of them stopped to say something to the manager, some excuse about something, and he said, "'That's all right. Get in a dressing room.' A three-piece band behind the drapes at the back of the stage began to make warm-up noises, and there were two bartenders keeping busy. Mostly it was beer, a midweek crowd. I finished my ale and had to wait a couple of minutes before I could get another bottle. The bar filled up from the end near the stage because all the customers wanted a good close look at the strippers for their fifty-cent bottles of beer. But I noticed that nobody sat down next to the kid, or if anybody did, he didn't stay long. You go out for some fun and the bartender pushes you around and nobody wants to sit next to you. I picked up my bottle and glass and went down on the stool to his left. He turned to me right away and said, "'What kind of place is this, anyway?' The broken veins were all over his face, little ones, but so many, so close, that they made his face look something like marbled rubber. The funny look in his eyes, was it, the trick contact lenses. But I tried not to stare and not to look away. "'It's okay,' I said. "'It's a good show if you don't mind a lot of noise from.' He stuck a cigarette into his mouth and poked the pack at me. "'I'm a spacer,' he said, interrupting. I took one of his cigarettes and said, "'Oh!' He snapped a lighter for the cigarettes and said, "'Venus!' I was noticing that his pack of cigarettes at the bar had some kind of yellow sticker instead of the blue tax stamp. "'Ain't that a crock?' he asked. "'You can't smoke and they give you lighters for a souvenir. "'But it's a good lighter.' On Mars last week, they gave us all some cheap pen and pencil sets. You get something every trip, huh? I took a good long drink of ale, and he finished his scotch and water. Shoot. You call a trip a shoot. One of the girls was working her way down the bar. She was going to slide onto the empty stool at his right and give him the business, but she looked at him first and decided not to. She curled around me and asked if I'd buy her a little old drink. I said no, and she moved on to the next. I could kind of feel the young fellow quivering. When I looked at him, he stood up. I followed him out of the dump. The manager grinned without thinking and said, Good night, boys, to us. The kid stopped in the street and said to me, You don't have to follow me around, pappy. He sounded like one wrong word, and I would get socked in the teeth. Take it easy. I know a place where they won't spit in your eye. He pulled himself together and made a joke of it. This I have to see, he said. Near here? A few blocks. We started walking. It was a nice night. I don't know this city at all, he said. I'm from Covington, Kentucky. You do your drinking at home there. We don't have places like this. He meant the whole Skid Row area. "'It's not so bad,' I said. "'I spend a lot of time here.' "'Is that a fact? "'I mean, down home a man your age "'would likely have a wife and children.' "'I do. "'The hell with them.' "'He laughed like a real youngster, "'and I figured he couldn't even be twenty-five. "'He didn't have any trouble "'with the broken curbstones "'in spite of his scotch and waters. "'I asked him about it. "'Sense of balance,' he said. You have to be tops for balance to be a spacer. You spend so much time outside in a suit. People don't know how much. Punctures. And you aren't worth a damn if you lose your point. What's that mean? Oh, well, it's hard to describe. When you're outside and you lose your point, it means you're all mixed up. You don't know which way the can, that's the ship, which way the can is. It's having all that room around you. But if you have a good balance, you feel a little tugging to the ship, or maybe you just know which way the ship is without feeling it. Then you have your point and you can get the work done. There must be a lot that's hard to describe. He thought that might be a crack, and he clammed up on me. You call this Gandhi Town, I said after a while. It's where the stove-up old railroad men hang out. This is the place. It was the second week of the month before everybody's pension check was all gone. Oswiak's was jumping. 
the grandsons of the pioneers were on the juke singing The Man from Mars Yodel, and old Paddy Shea was jigging in the middle of the floor. He had a full sidle of beer in his right hand, and his empty left sleeve was flapping. The kid balked at the screen door. Too damn bright, he said. I shrugged and went on in, and he followed. We sat down at a table. At Oswiak's you can drink at the bar if you want to, but none of the regulars do. Paddy jigged over and said, Welcome home, Doc. He's a Liverpool Irishman. They talk like Scots, some say, but they sound almost like Brooklyn to me. Hello, Paddy. I brought somebody uglier than you. Now what do you say? Paddy jigged around the kid in a half circle with his sleeve flapping and then flopped into a chair when the record stopped. He took a big drink from the sidle and said, Can you do this? Paddy stretched his face into an awful grin that showed his teeth. He had three of them. The kid laughed and asked me, What the hell did you drag me into here for? Paddy says he'll buy drinks for the house the day anybody uglier than he is come in. Ozuak's wife waddled over for the order, and the kid asked us what we'd have. I figured I could start drinking, so it was three double scotches. After the second round, Paddy started blowing about how they took his arm off without any anaesthetics except a bottle of gin because the Red Bull fright he was tangled up in couldn't wait. That brought some of the other old gimps over to the table with their stories. Blackie Bower had been sitting in a boxcar with his legs sticking through the door when the train started with a jerk. Wham! The door closed. Everybody laughed at Blackie for being that dumb in the first place, and he got mad. Sam Fireman has palsy. This week was claiming he used to be a watchmaker before he began to shake. The week before, he'd said he was a brain surgeon. A woman I didn't know, a real old boxcar Bertha, dragged herself over and began some kind of story about how her sister married a Greek, but she passed out before we found out what happened. Somebody wanted to know what was wrong with the kid's face. Bauer, I think it was, after he came back to the table. Compression and decompression, the kid said. You're all the time climbing into your suit and out of your suit. Inboard air is thin to start with. You get a few red lines, that is ruptured blood vessels, and you stay the hell with the money. All you make is just one more trip. But, God, it's a lot of money for anybody my age. You keep saying that until you can't be anything but a spacer. The eyes are hard radiation scars. You like dot all over? asked Oswiak's wife politely. All over, ma'am, the kid told her in a miserable voice. But I'm going to quit before I get a bowman head. I don't care, said Maggie Rorty. I think he's cute. Compared with, Paddy began, but I kicked him under the table. We sang for a while, and then we told gags and recited limericks for a while, and I noticed that the kid and Maggie had wandered into the back room, the one with a latch on the door. Oswiak's wife asked me, very puzzled, Doc, why they do dot flank by plan yet? It's the damn government, Sam Fireman said. Why not, I said. They got the Bowman drive. Why the hell shouldn't they use it? Serves them right. I had a double scotch and added, Twenty years of it, and they found out a few things they didn't know. Red lines are only one of them. Twenty years more, maybe they'll find out a few more things they didn't know. Maybe by the time there's a bathtub in every American home and an alcoholism clinic in every American town, they'll find out a whole lot of things they didn't know and every American boy will be a pop-eyed, blood-raddled wreck, like our friend here from riding the Bowman Drive. It's the damn government, Sam Fireman repeated. And what the hell did you mean by that remark about alcoholism? Paddy said, real sore. Personally, I can take it or leave it alone. So we got to talking about that, and everybody there turned out to be people who could take it or leave it alone. It was maybe midnight when the kid showed at the table again, looking kind of dazed. I was drunker than I ought to be by midnight, so I said I was going for a walk. He tagged along and we wound up on a bench at Screwball Square. The soap boxes were still going strong. 
Like I said, it was a nice night. After a while, a pot-bellied old auntie, who didn't give a damn about the face, sat down and tried to talk the kid into going to see some etchings. The kid didn't get it, and I led him over to hear the soapboxes before there was trouble. One of the orators was a mush-mouthed evangelist. And, oh, my friends, he said, when I looked through the porthole of the spaceship and beheld the wonder of the firmament. You're a stinking Yankee liar, the kid yelled at him. You say one damn more word about can shooting, and I'll ram your spaceship down your lying throat. Where's your red lines if you're such a hot spacer? The crowd didn't know what he was talking about, but where's your red lines sounded good to them, so they heckled Mushmouth off his box with it. I got the kid to a bench. The liquor was working in him all of a sudden. He simmered down after a while and asked, Doc, should I have given Miss Rorty some money? I asked her afterward, and she said she'd admire to have something to remember me by, so I gave her my lighter. She seems to be real pleased with it, but I was wondering if maybe I embarrassed her by asking her right out. Like I told you, back in Covington, Kentucky, we don't have places like that. Or maybe we did, and I just didn't know about them. But what do you think I should have done about Miss Rorty? Just what you did, I told him. If they want money, they ask you for it first. Where are you staying? YMCA, he said, almost asleep. Back in Covington, Kentucky, I was a member of the Y, and I kept up my membership. They have to let me in because I'm a member. Spaces have all kind of trouble, Doc. Woman trouble, hotel trouble, family trouble, religious trouble. I was raised a Southern Baptist, but where's heaven anyway? I asked Dr. Chitwood last time at home before the red lines got so thick. Doc... You aren't a minister of the gospel, are you? I did hope I didn't say anything to offend you. No offence, son, I said. No offence. I walked him to the avenue and waited for a fleet cab. It was almost five minutes. The independence that roll drunks dent the fenders of fleet cabs if they show up in Skid Row, and then the fleet drivers have to make reports on their own time to the company. It keeps them away. But I got one and dumped the kid in. The Y Hotel, I told the driver. Here's five. Help him in when you get there. When I walked through Screwball Square again, some college kids were yelling, Where's your red lines? at old Charlie, the last of the wobblies. Old Charlie kept roaring, The hell with your bread lines! I'm talking about atomic bombs! Right up there! And he pointed at the moon. It was a nice night, but the liquor was dying in me. There was a joint around the corner, so I went in and had a drink to carry me to the club. I had a bottle there. I got into the first cab that came. Athletic club, I said. In a doghouse, huh? The driver said, and he gave me a big personality smile. I didn't say anything, and he started the car. He was right, of course. I was in everybody's doghouse. Some day I'd scare hell out of Tom and Lise by going home and showing them what their daddy looked like. Down at the Institute, I was in the doghouse. Oh dear, everybody at the Institute said to everybody. I'm sure I don't know what ails the man. A lovely wife and two lovely grown children, and she had to tell him, either you go or I go. And drinking! And this is rather subtle but it's a well-known fact that neurotics seek out low company to compensate for their guilt feelings. The places he frequents. Dr. Francis Bowman, the man who made spaceflight a reality. The man who put the bomb base on the moon. Really, I'm sure I don't know what ails him. The hell with them all. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Star Mother by Robert F. Young Originally published in Amazing Stories, January 1959 Narrated by Tom Tresel That night her son was the first star. She stood motionless in the garden, one hand pressed against her heart, watching him rise above the fields where he had played as a boy, where he had worked as a young man, and she wondered whether he was thinking of those fields now, 
whether he was thinking of her standing alone in the April night with her memories, whether he was thinking of the verandahed house behind her, with its empty rooms and silent halls, that once upon a time had been his birthplace. Higher still and higher he rose in the southern sky, and then, when he had reached his zenith, he dropped swiftly down the past the dark edge of the earth and disappeared from sight. A boy grown up too soon, riding round and round the world on a celestial carousel, encased in an airtight metal capsule in an airtight metal chariot. Why don't they leave the stars alone, she thought. Why don't they leave the stars to God? The general's second telegram came early the next morning. Explorer 12 doing splendidly. Expect to bring your son down some time tomorrow. She went about her work as usual, collecting the eggs and allocating them in their cardboard boxes, then setting off in the station wagon on her Tuesday morning run. She had expected a deluge of questions from her customers. She was not disappointed. Is Terry really way up there all alone, Martha? Aren't you scared, Martha? I do hope they can get him back down all right, Martha. She supposed it must have given them quite a turn to have their egg woman change into a star mother overnight. She hadn't expected the TV interview, though, and she would have avoided it if it had been politely possible. But what could she do when the line of cars and trucks pulled into the drive and the technicians got out and started setting up their equipment in the backyard? What could she say when the suave young man came up to her and said, "'We want you to know that we're all very proud of your boy up there, ma'am,' and we hope you'll do us the honour of answering a few questions. Most of the questions concerned Terry, as was fitting. From the way the suave young man asked them, though, she got the impression that he was trying to prove that her son was just like any other average American boy, and as such just didn't happen to be the case. But whoever she opened her mouth to mention, say, how he used to study till all hours of the night, or how difficult it had been for him to make friends because of his shyness, or the fact that he had never gone out for football. Whenever she started to mention any of these things, the suave young man was in great haste to interrupt her and to twist her words by re-questioning into a different meaning altogether, till Terry's behaviour pattern seemed to coincide with a behaviour pattern where the suave young man apparently considered the norm, but which, if followed, Martha was sure, would produce not young men bent on exploring space, but young men bent on exploring trivia. A few of the questions concerned herself. Was Terry her only child? Yes. What had happened to her husband? He was killed in the Korean War. What did she think of the new law granting star mothers top priority on any and all information relating to their sons? I think it's a fine law. It's too bad they couldn't have shown similar humanity toward the war mothers of World War II. It was late in the afternoon by the time the TV crew got everything repacked into their cars and trucks and made their departure. Martha fixed herself a light supper, then donned an old suede jacket of Terry's and went out into the garden to wait for the sun to go down. According to the timetable the General had outlined in his first telegram, Terry's first Tuesday night passage wasn't due to occur till 9.05, but it seemed only right that she should be outside when the stars started to come out. Presently they did, and she watched them wink on, one by one, in the deepening darkness of the sky. She'd never been much of one for the stars. Most of her life she'd been much too busy on earth to bother with things celestial. She could remember when she was much younger and Bill was courting her, looking up at the moon sometimes, and once in a while when a star fell, making a wish. But this was different. It was different because now she had a personal interest in the sky, a new affinity with its myriad inhabitants. And how bright they became when you kept looking at them. They seemed to come alive, almost, pulsing brilliantly down out of the blackness of the night. And there were different colours, too, she noticed with a start. Some of them were blue, and some were red. Others were yellow, green, orange. It grew cold in the April garden, and she could see her breath. There was a strange crispness, 
a strange clarity about the night that she had never known before. She glanced at her watch, was astonished to see that the hands indicated two minutes after nine. Where had the time gone? Tremulously she faced the southern horizon and saw her Terry appear in his shining chariot, riding up the star-pebbled path of his orbit, a star in his own right, dropping swiftly now, down, down, and out of sight beyond the dark, wheeling mass of the earth. She took a deep, proud breath, realising that she was wildly waving her hand and let it fall slowly to her side. Make a wish, she thought, like a little girl, and she wished him pleasant dreams and a safe return, and wrapped the wish in all her love and cast it starward. Sometime tomorrow, the general's telegram had said, That meant sometime today. She rose with the sun and fed the chickens, fixed and ate her breakfast, collected the eggs and put them in their cardboard boxes, then started out on her Wednesday morning run. My land, Martha, I don't see how you stand it with him way up there. Doesn't it get on your nerves? Yes, yes it does. Martha, when are they bringing him back down? Today, today. It must be wonderful being a star, Mother Martha. Yes, it is, in a way. Wonderful and terrible. If only he can last it out for a few more hours, she thought. If only they can bring him down safe and sound. Then the vigil will be over, and some other mother can take over the awesome responsibility of having a son become a star. If only. The General's third telegram arrived that afternoon. Regret to inform you that meteorite impact on satellite hull severely damaged capsule detachment mechanism, making ejection impossible. Will make every effort to find another means of accomplishing your son's return. Terry! See the little boy playing beneath a maple tree, moving his tiny cars up and down the tiny streets of his make-believe village. The little boy, his fuzz of hair gold in the sunlight, his cherub cheeks pink in the summer wind. Terry! Up the lane the blue-denimed young man walks, swinging his thin tanned arms, his long legs making near grown-up strides over the sun-seared grass, the sky blue and bright behind him, the song of cicada rising and falling in the hazy September air. Terry! Probably won't get a chance to write you again before take-off, but don't worry, Ma. The Explorer 12 is the greatest bird they ever built. Nothing short of a direct meteorite hit can hit it, and their odds are a million to one. Why don't they leave the stars alone? Why don't they leave the stars to God? The afternoon shadows lengthened on the lawn, and the sun grew red and swollen over the western hills. Martha fixed supper, tried to eat, and couldn't. After a while, when the light began to fade, she slipped into Terry's jacket and went outside. Slowly the sky darkened and the stars began to appear. At length her star appeared, but its swift passage blurred before her eyes. Tires crunched on the gravel then, and headlights watched the darkness from the drive. The car door slammed. Martha did not move. Please, God, she thought, let it be Terry, even though she knew it couldn't possibly be Terry. Footsteps sounded behind her, paused. Someone coughed softly. She turned then. Good evening, ma'am. She saw the circlet of stars on the grey epaulet. She saw the stern, handsome face. She saw the dark, tired eyes. And she knew. Even before he spoke again, she knew. The same meteorite that damaged the ejection mechanism, ma'am. It penetrated the capsule, too. We didn't find out till just a while ago, but there was nothing we could have done anyway. Are you all right, ma'am? Yes, I'm all right. I wanted to express my regrets personally. I know how you must feel. It's all right. We will, of course, make every effort to bring back his remains so that he can have a fitting burial on earth. No, she said. I beg your pardon, ma'am. 
she raised her eyes to the patch of sky where her son had passed in his shining metal sarcophagus. Sirius blossomed there, blue-white and beautiful. She raised her eyes still higher and beheld the vast parterre of Orion with its central motif of vivid forget-me-nots, its far-flung blooms of Betelgeuse and Rigel, of Bellatrix and Safe, and higher yet, and there flamed the exquisite flower-beds of Taurus and Gemini, the burgeoned the riotous wreath of the crab, there lay the pulsing petals of the Pleiades, and down the ecliptic garden-path, wafted by a stellar breeze, drifted the ochre rose of Mars. No, she said again. The general had raised his eyes too now. Slowly he lowered them. I think I understand, ma'am, and I'm glad that's the way you want it. The stars are beautiful tonight, aren't they? More beautiful than they've ever been, she said. After the general had gone, she looked up once more at the vast and variegated garden of the sky where her son lay buried. Then she turned and walked slowly back to the memoried house. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. A new story every single day.